One second. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, I'll start. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so I think I'm gonna start with the first uh, slide or two. The, uh, and you can read some of the things. So I can tell you the story of, of how this building, the idea of it was conceived. You know, the, uh, we have two state mental health hospitals uh, and they were built, uh, they're creatively named Western and Eastern. They were built over a hundred years ago before there were treatments for depression and post-traumatic stress disorder and bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Um, dementia, all kinds of things. And so patients were sent off to a remote area and they would live out their lives there. But uh, we've made some advances in the last hundred years and lots of different kinds of treatment. And so uh, the idea uh, that we would hospitalize patients so far away from their families, so far away from the case managers who might help them, so far away from the uh, um, the resources uh, that they need uh, is, is a very outdated idea. Uh, and uh, not only are there, is there a benefit of course in modern medications and things like that, but uh, modern types of psychotherapy for a lot of these disorders certainly help uh, and a, a much more of a healing environment um, and less of all the kinds of terms that we associate with the word asylum uh, would be helpful. So, the, uh, but there are more advances to be made too. So this idea that the state would partner with the University of Washington uh, to build a, a state-of-the-art building uh, that would, uh, where you could hospitalize patients uh, near their family, near their friends, uh, near a kind of a supportive environment um, and on the inside and outside, not have it look uh, like a prison or anything like that. Uh, but have it have it be designed like a healing environment should be, uh, like uh, modern hospitals are for patients who are on medicine and cancer wards and things like that. But uh, uh, design those kinds of treatments for uh, patients with behavioral health issues. That's part of what happened. And so um, that's a piece of this. That's those 75 beds for long-term 90 to 180 day civil commitment patients. That word civil is differentiates it from forensic. These are not patients who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity or things like this. These are uh, patients who have had hospitalizations already somewhere, usually in the community, uh, and have stayed a certain number of days and it's felt like they might need to stay longer. And so that's a piece of this. There are these additional adult psychiatry beds for geriatric patients. There's already a 27 bed geriatric psychiatry unit, actually it's an adult psychiatry unit that's there now. Um, uh, for decades, it was exclusively geriatric, but now it's adult. Uh, there are medical surgical beds uh, for uh, patients who, you know, are hospitalized for pneumonia or something like that, but also uh, have depression or who may be hospitalized after a suicide attempt. There are all kinds of things where you would want to co-locate uh, physicians and nurses and occupational therapists and social workers and all kinds of folks who are comfortable working with patients who have more than one thing going on. Uh, we, this next one, we run a, uh, a consult line. So any uh, prescriber in our state can call and reach a UW psychiatrist 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, reach directly uh, to talk about difficult cases. Uh, more than half of the counties in our state do not have a psychiatrist. And so primary care doctors and emergency room doctors and all kinds of nurse practitioners uh, from all over our state uh, are taking care and delivering behavioral health care. So this is a way for them to talk to providers. This hospital will have space uh, to operate that out of. And you can imagine there are quite a few psychiatrists in this building. And so it's an easy way to uh, staff this, this idea. Um, there's a, there'll be a neuromodulation center there. Uh, we'll have different types of neuromodulation, including ECT, which uh, is not what you've seen in the movies uh, and is uh, a much more modern and effective uh, way to treat uh, certain types of refractory depression and things like that. Um, and a, an emergency room kind of an observation unit where uh, patients who uh, would present normally to the emergency room, but uh, present for behavioral health reasons, like they're feeling suicidal or uh, they're all, they ran out of one of their medications or something like that. It's a way for them to 
uh, talk to a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner who will be there 24 hours a day. Uh, the other piece of it is this teaching part. So the University of Washington has the largest psychiatry residency training program in the country. Uh, we also have an enormous psychiatry, psych ARNP training program where we, we're starting a fellowship uh, for psychiatric ARMPs too. This is this idea that our state does not have enough behavioral health providers, uh, whether they be uh, psychiatrists or psych nurse practitioners or therapists, uh, lots of different kinds. And so uh, this building will also, is also being designed to work as a training facility. So you kind of design it with larger spaces in mind, you know, with uh, bigger rooms, uh, interview rooms and things like that. Uh, nursing students and all kinds of things uh, to not just then deliver care here, but then hopefully provide uh, behavioral health care providers for the rest of our state too. Uh, oh, and the bottom is the kitchen facilities. That's the uh, replacing the, uh, the kitchen and the dining room for the entire campus will be in that building. Um, so what do you have the next slide, Jeannie? Oh, this was part of the process with the architects actually, identifying um, priorities and goals, uh, uh, kind of identifying the purpose um, and the, the general feel that we wanted from this facility uh, and then starting the design work around it. Um, this idea, I'll touch on just a few of these, this idea that, uh, um, it should be a healing environment. That is, there are treatments that work. And uh, even for our patients who have the most, uh, who are suffering the most from their behavioral health issues, there are treatments that work. We should, it should be a healing environment and not look like a prison. Um, the education I touched on, the idea of uh, research, developing uh, novel treatment programs uh, for these patients. Um, safety uh, is high on our priority, not just for the patients. We don't want the patients to get hurt, but we don't want our staff to get hurt. We don't want the community to get hurt. Uh, that is a, uh, a piece that was designed uh, by this. This idea of sustainability um, is important in a modern building, uh, especially one that's being built by the state and the University of Washington. Uh, and another piece of that is this, this connection with the outdoors. So uh, most of the psychiatry units in our state don't have an outdoor area. And so you can imagine that if a patient is staying for three months, it would be very hard to be stuck inside. Uh, so these rooms are individual rooms with large windows where the patients can see out and we have outdoor areas. We'll touch on this on every floor and one larger even outdoor area that's kind of set above so that uh, the patients um, can get some outdoors. There's all kinds of research, like uh, patients who get more sunshine during the day when they're in the hospital for depression, have their depression uh, re they recover more quickly than patients uh, who get no sunshine. These aren't shocking things to say, but they, but psychiatry buildings are rarely designed intentionally. That is, you kind of build a psychiatry floor in inside of an existing hospital. To be able to build a building specifically designed for this purpose, then ought to be able to improve the, uh, the quality of care and the results that we see. So that's a few of those things. Do you want to go to the next one? Is this you, Pam? Yep, I'm going to hand it over to Amy. Or our yeah, oh, okay. this, is, this is mine. So I would just touch on the, the idea of welcoming because I think one of the new care models that comes out of the design of this facility is integrating family and visitors, loved ones into the model of care. And so the idea that you create a space that is welcoming, that takes away the stigma of behavioral health care is really important. And you'll see in the next couple of slides that it's integral to the way we design. Not only does it look good, but it, it makes you feel like you should be there and that you should be a part of, of the healing that goes on in the environments. Um, so as you all know, the, 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 the where, where we are located um, here, but the, the behavioral health teaching facility specifically is located on the Northeast corner of campus near the Burke, um, the Burke Street entrance. Um, it is in the location of the previous D-Wing building. The building and the associated parking run along the east buffer of the campus. I'm, I'm sorry, I said Burke Street, Burke Avenue. And, um, Along this localized site improvement, 
associated with the building. The project also includes improvements for existing the existing pedestrian pathway from 105th Street all the way up to the A wing and into the B, uh, the behavioral health teaching facility building, making it universally accept, uh, accessible to all uh, who are coming to campus. So not just those being dropped off, but those um, utilizing public transportation. Next slide. So the, uh, I think the organization will walk you through a series of block diagrams. So this is like a little Lego interpretation of what our building looks like. Um, and I think that that organization of the building is really instrumental to this new model of care that Ryan was describing. Um, so the building connects to the A-wing via this blue block or the public zone. The public connection is located on the second floor from the A-wing and connects over the ED drop-off area. So if you're familiar with the ED, the emergency department, sorry, into acronyms here, the emergency department is shown in red there. That's where you would drop off. Um, so this bridge connector goes across that ED space and connects uh, in, a, in a publicly visible way, uh, people from A-Wing who are using uh, the, the services in, um, in the new behavioral health teaching facility. Um, and then the main entry is located just to the south of this, um, so you can see there in the, in the gray main drop-off area. So we have a nice, public connection uh, for those who are dropping off um, and visiting the new building. Uh, another amenity of note on the first floor is the new dining areas, as Ryan mentioned. So just, uh, just north of that public uh, block right there, that's the, dining, that's the dining facility and it serves the entire campus. So it was really important for the project to connect publicly um, in an easy way for people to kind of come across. So everybody in the whole campus will be engaging on the first floor um, of the building with this, new, with this new building. And then the other thing to note is this green block right in front of that public area is the outdoor dining terrace. And we have a really nice connection to the outside um, for the public, for staff, for visitors um, to come and enjoy the Pacific Northwest um, landscape that we'll, we'll be um, adding to the landscape. As you all know, the, you can go to the next slide. Um, the, the, uh, the Northwest campus is quite a beautiful, um, is quite beautifully landscaped and it's something that we were looking to continue and improve upon uh, even more with our building. So here you can see we've added this kind of support block. The first floor is mainly for support of the building. Um, it has a loading dock area. It's got a secured sally port area. So the sally port is where visit, uh, sorry, patients who are arriving via ambulance would come in through a secured area, which is to the back of house of the, of the um, it's not through the front, the front uh, main public entrance. Um, and then you also have the neuromodulation clinic on the first floor, which is an outpatient service um, per, um, area. Um, yeah, go to the next slide, please. So the next two floors above, so second floor and third floor are the medical surgical uh, floors. They're shown in purple. Um, these will connect back to the A-wing via service bridge. You can kind of see a little purple connector that um, helps to provide additional care to the, to the hospital, but it also, and I think the primary, um, the primary purpose of these medical surgical beds are the co-location of those within this, um, this new building is to, meant to provide care for patients who have also been admitted to the hospital for a psychiatric condition. And these, these floors will have 50 medical surgical beds. And as, and as uh, Dr. Kimmel noted, on the second floor, we also have a new observation unit for psychiatric care. You can go to the next floor. Uh, next slide. Um, and then on the top floor, you can see, so this is floors four through six. We have the, the main uh, secured behavioral health bed areas. 
Um, and if we click to the next slide, you can see how those uh, beds are organized around the patient therapy area. And the patient therapy area, um, we are able to maximize the use of efficiency of the space here by bringing it all to the front and center of the building. And then if you click another one through Pam, you can see its connection to that outdoor space. It's really important to the model of care for patients who are living uh, long-term in this facility to have that access to green space. This is on the fourth floor, so it's, a, it's entirely secured. Um, and it allows patients, uh, and you'll see in some of the renderings uh, shortly, it allows patients to really experience nature, but in a secure way. Um, and then the last slide is just kind of showing it in the context of the campus. Um, so if you click to the next one, this rendering shows how the, the, the massing of the building, uh, the, the envelope of the building is rendered in a terracotta. So it's, uh, it's a, it's complements the existing brick on campus. And then at the front, you can see there's a metal panel and glass area. That's where that therapy block is. And it has very generous uh, windows that allow natural light and the patients to really um, enjoy the views of the beautiful campus beyond. In the foreground, you can see there's a, a, a nice entry canopy, which allows for easy wayfinding and people to understand how to access and enter the building, how to drop off loved ones. Um, and then on the fourth floor up there, you can see there's the therapy terrace. And what I love about this is that it doesn't look like your traditional fenced off, penned in area. It really looks like it's part of the building um, and, What's nice about that, that has a, a very beautiful woven mesh screening. It, it's very open, you can see through it, but it provides that secure environment for the patients. And then- Besides being able to get outside the, that it, it will be a therapy area itself, that outside area. You know, I, when we were thinking about this building, I went and toured some other ones. I went to one at UCLA. You can imagine there's outdoor areas in Los Angeles. You know, the patients um, had gardens there, and you know, there were butterflies in the, I mean, birds that come when you plant flowers and things like that. There are, um, there are ways to um, allow these patients to, the things that we all usually enjoy and add value to our lives, even if they're hospitalized for a long period. So, right. And I know you had like physical therapy or yoga. Like there will be kind of activities out there, which in group settings, it'll it'll be really beneficial to to that community. Um, the other thing that I'll note here is that you can see the landscaping in the foreground. We've replaced um, the trees in, in almost a two to one tree replacement and we're maintaining a 30% tree canopy on the campus. So again, continuing that very beautiful landscape that the, the, um, the campus already has. And if you go to the next one, you can just see this is an image of the ED drop off area with that public connector. Um, continue. We have a lot of renderings. Here's another building. <laughs> Here's another view of the drop-off area with, um, you can see that it's, it's pretty clear wayfinding. If you go to the next one, um, you can see these very beautiful fringe trees, uh, which bloom in the springtime, and those will dot the, the front uh, area of the landscaping, and then we'll also have additional scarlet oaks, which will be very beautiful in the fall time, which will line the campus road. Um, so really a very nice thing to look at, but also look down on to sort of be in a surrounding of, and we think that this will really create, the landscape I think is a very critical component to the healing aspect of this building. And go to the next one. Just another view of that two-story lobby space. So again, welcoming, open, really uh, inviting you to look at the landscape while you're in the building. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see this dining terrace. So this is this new, uh, this is much better than the old checkers. No offense, Pam, but <laughs> this is no gonna mistaken. be a really beautiful place to eat um, uh, for everybody in the building. Um, so we're really excited about that proximity to the landscape there. And then you can see these are some renderings of the interior of the, um, the dining facilities, which are still, we're still working out. I think this is actually a, a fairly old rendering of the, of the furniture, but we have like this really nice dining terrace. And I think it's gonna be a good um, 
it's, it's going to be a really good space, not only for the mental health of visitors, but to the staff, right? It's a place of respite. Um, and I think that connection is really important um, and something that we tried to build around in this, in this uh, design. And but I like the, that the, my favorite part about this too is that the staff from all over the hospital will come. This, it matches the kind of the patient mission model too. This, you can't treat uh, behavioral health issues and ignore medical issues. You can't treat medical issues and ignore behavioral health issues. And so that's part of the plan of the building. And then also then the staff, they're from all over the hospital, regardless of where they work, they're in this building at times, seeing the patients and eating lunch and things like that. It's, it's behavioral health care should be part of medical care. And so that's part of what was what the goal was of these things as well. And as we kind of move into the interior shots here, this is the entry lobby. You'll see this has a very hospitality feel and that is intentional. The point that I think we tried to, to make with a lot of the selections of materials, you'll see wood, you'll see softer materials, uh, calming um, colors that are that are help the healing environments to really have a hospitality feel here because we think that that adds to the level of new care um, that we hope to bring to this space make you feel like you're at home make visitors feel welcome make patients feel welcome so um, we're really excited about this and you can see there's a connecting stair just to the right of the the um, the main welcome desk there and that's where you kind of go up and connect into the a wing there's also an elevator connection. Um, yeah, so this is a view of the medical surgical rooms. Again, those these kind of healing materials on the interiors, um, the, the wood laminate. Um, and as I think, Pam, you were mentioning, you know, the generous views to the outside, natural daylight, access to the beautiful campus beyond was really important to the planning of a lot of these rooms. So they're bigger than you would normally see. Um, in a hospital setting, the windows. This is a view from the, the, um, the therapy terrace. You can see here, it almost looks like there's no screen there. I promise you there's a screen, but it, that's intentional. And it really is to make patients feel like they're outside, not that they're staring at a chair, chain link fence. And from, from below, it really will look like kind of the shimmery fence, fencing material, it doesn't even, fence won't even enter the, the lexicon when you look at, it. it will look like a shimmering plane. And we're really excited about using this material because um, it, it really is meant to be, um, open your perspective on what you can look at and allow you to enjoy the, the landscape rather than look at the fence and, and feel like you're, you're, you're stuck in there. Um, and we're also excited to bring really nice natural Pacific Northwest plantings um, to, to this area. And another, another view, Pam, you can see this from above. There are gonna be very beautiful plantings. And I think the idea of biophilic healing is really important here. Um, you know, the smell of the landscape <laughs> is gonna be pretty critical. Like, you know, just the, the, the daily things that we take for granted as we walk by, um, our garden or a nice planting like in the neighborhood. That's something that they can enjoy too on a daily basis. And then lastly, this is a view of the interiors of the room. So this is very similar to the medical surgical floors in terms of finish and look and feel. Um, and these are all behavioral health compliant rooms. And lastly, the uh, this is the the therapy area. So this is like the communal therapy room where visitors as well as uh, patients and staff will be um, receiving care. And this is, that was this kind of a common area too, that, that picture. So mm -hmm. in the background in, in psychiatry, you don't want patients to just isolate in their rooms. That's not a good way to help depression. And so, but in order to get folks out of their rooms, you need to have open interesting, normal areas. It's like the idea that uh, you spend more your time home. during the day in the living room of your house mm -hmm. than your bedroom. Uh, uh, and those kinds of things with the daylight can help with treat depression. Thank you. All right, we're gonna hand it over to Matt to talk about the schedule a little bit. Yeah, so Amy and Ryan did a great job kind of explaining to you what our building is gonna look like here. Uh, the schedule that you see uh, on the bottom of the screen is, is going to put us towards what we in construction call a substantial completion, which means the building will be complete 
Uh, the owner will be able to start moving in. Uh, the University of Washington Medical Center will be able to start moving in uh, equipment. They will be able to start getting familiar with the facility, understanding how to operate the facility uh, with the expectation that the facility will be open sometime in the spring of 2024. Um, as many of you are aware, there was a concrete strike. Uh, it's actually a Teamster strike that impacted the delivery of concrete that has slowed the project down. Um, we have found ways to mitigate it. For, so for those of you that have uh, had access or looked at our camera, you have noticed we, we have been able to deliver concrete. Some of the concrete plants have reopened with Teamster drivers. So we are able to use the Teamster drivers, union drivers. Uh, it was very important for the university, but also the Teamsters to Get, get people put back to work and they understood how important specifically this facility was. So they helped prioritize the ability for us to move the project forward. Uh, it's very important for us to be able to do that so that we can deliver this facility. We do understand how important this facility is not only to the neighborhood, um, but also to the state of Washington. And as Ryan described, it's also a teaching facility. So it's important to really uh, healthcare as, as a whole. So, so we're doing our best to try to um, mitigate the concrete strike uh, and, and build the building as quickly as we possibly can. Um, so what you see on the bottom of the screen there is a very high level uh, um, schedule for, for, for our expectations of completing the building um, early 2024. And then here are a couple of links for everybody to look at. The first one is our construction bulletin. We do post the bulletin monthly uh, for the neighborhood to see, to understand what is expected to happen on the job site um, through the different durations or, or um, portions of the, of the construction. Uh, so you'll be able to understand what we're doing. If there are any possible impacts, we are doing everything we can to mitigate all impacts to the neighborhood. But as you can imagine, a building, building a facility of this size, we will have to bring in material and different things like that. And then the second link, it's called an Ox Blue camera. So that is actually a screenshot of the Ox Blue there. It gives you the ability to actually watch the building um, being built. Uh, it also has a time lapse, which is really cool. So you can click on the time lapse and see from when the D wing was actually there, the building that was there prior to us demoing the building and where we are now. And that link and the camera will be in the same location through the duration of the project. Uh, so it'll be a cool time lapse video for everybody to see. Uh, for me personally, seeing all that concrete out there is very exciting. Uh, we did go about four months without having any concrete. And for me in the construction industry, uh, sitting around waiting is not something that we're very good at. So uh, we're excited about moving the project forward and excited about being able to uh, bring this facility to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for all that information. And, and I think this would be a good time to open it up for questions. And I will stop sharing so we can all see each other. Can you post those URLs in the um, chat? Yes. Uh, actually, would uh, do you, can you share your deck with us? Absol absolutely, even with better. That. Yes, do you want me to forward it to you, Ethan, right. and then you can share it? Yes, thank you. Okay. We'll put that up on the uh, website. When we write up the meeting, too, we'll put a link to that if that's OK. Absolutely. Um, I have allowed everybody to unmute yourself. Uh, if you could, there's a way to raise your hand. Uh, is it one of the reactions at the bottom? Oh, how do we raise your hand again? Uh, to ask that, to uh, then be called upon. Oh yeah, raise hand. So there's reactions at the bottom of the screen there. In the very bottom of that, all the way across, is raise hand. I've just raised my hand. Um, I will lower it. If you do that, and then go ahead, Pam, if you could just call on somebody for a question. If you can, you see the participants list, or I could do that if you can. Do you want to? I, I can't see them all. Do you want to call on them, and then we'll figure out who's appropriate to answer? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. And to get us started, I'll ask a question, if I may. Um, 150 beds is great, but my understanding is we're way behind on beds in the state for patients with this kind of long-term need, especially involuntary commitment. Uh, what is that? 
need now? How does this compare to that? Ryan, you want to talk about that? I can't give you an exact figure, right? We are way behind it in with psychiatry beds in general for a long time. Washington has been the as they've had the fewest psychiatric beds per capita in the country. We might have recently moved up a slot or two. We're still in the bottom 10%. In terms of these beds, you don't want to. The idea is in the current strategy, as I understand it. Now, I'm not the uh, I'm not a legislature, the legislator, the governor, so I can't tell you the strategy completely. But the idea you build multiple facilities around the state, it doesn't just like how we don't want every patient uh, going down to Silicon, you wouldn't want every patient coming up to Seattle either. If there's a patient from Yakima, you might want to have a facility closer to there or Spokane, um, all kinds of things like that. So I don't know to what degree, how many, how many patients are, would be eligible currently at Western and an Eastern facility like this, but uh, um, 75 is what we thought we could manage and we are the, um, a large metropolitan area. And so that's part of, uh, that was the decision around that. Thank you very much. Um, Celia, could you ask? Yes, I'd like to know, what do you mean by behavioral health compliant rooms? Yeah, so the, uh, the F, there's a guideline that um, is used to um, make sure that the what's being provided within the rooms um, will not pose a harm to the patient. So we're talking about um, ligature risks, um, and that's the, the potential for patients to hang themselves. Um, anything sharp in the room, we avoid kind of sharp edges. Um, anything with flat horizontal edges, usually not, not, um, uh, not being put into rooms like that. And that's all based on level of risk. That's the assessment of the, 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 um, the hospital uh, and dictated by the hospital. But these rooms... Um, will be outfitted with items just like in your room, but they have um, care that's provided so that you can't access, so you can't tamper with things. Um, screws look slightly different in a, in a behavioral health room. Um, it's minor adjustments uh, that, that um, honestly, if you went into the room, you probably wouldn't notice them. But if you kind of look like, oh, I don't ever saw the top of, of, of a, of a Bureau that looked like that before, like so. I think there's there's just minor tweaks that uh, allow the the room to be safe for patients who might self harm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, please ask. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's wonderful that we're able to our neighborhood is able to host this facility. It seems like a really really wonderful, not only for us, but for the state as a whole. Do you have any feeling for how much change there will be in terms of traffic flow uh, into the, onto the campus as a result of the, of the change? Will it be significant? And if it is, what kind of planning is gonna be happening in a couple of years when it actually starts getting used? Julie, do you mind if I call on you? I know we did a traffic study related to this. Yeah. Um, yes, we did a we did a supplemental environmental impact statement for this project to study uh, traffic, and it does a, it. There is an increase, but it was not substantial. Um, the people come from a wide range of places around this facility, and so the distribution of traffic is um, spread out and that the city streets still have the capacity to be able to, to handle the change. Uh, I don't think you will um, notice a significant difference uh, uh, once it, maybe, maybe in the first few days when people are trying to orient themselves and such, but the patterns I think will, will not be very noticeable. Thank you. Um, a running. Hi, yes, thanks. This is Anne. Um, I think the facility looks great and I appreciate the information. I did have just kind of a general question of 
um, strategies that might be in place for staffing the facility, given the staffing challenges with nurses ongoing, and if that's kind of projected out as and what the game plan might be on that. I'll briefly cover that, and that's a great question. Um, early, early recruitment is what I will say. We we are. I know that HR and others are doing a very um, extensive look at how to recruit and retain given the labor shortages in healthcare right now. And but for this facility particularly, we will be recruiting early as possible, training, onboarding. And part of the plan for this facility is also a phased opening. And so we will not open any area until we feel that we are able to adequately and safely staff it. Thank you, Linda. Hi, Linda McCoy, um, and I live in the neighborhood at in Halcyon Mobile Home Park. And um, I'm wondering, is there any uh, drug addiction rehabilitation focus in this center, or would that be somewhere else? So I can answer that. So um, there, there are facilities that are specifically designed for substance use disorders, meaning that, uh, and this is not, you, typically you wouldn't be admitted this, this facility if that was your only issue or the, the primary issue. Now, a lot of folks who suffer from depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder, lots of different things, also uh, have substance use issues. And so the we will treat those things together, but this isn't, it won't have, Oh, there are lots of different, it doesn't, it's not a detox facility and it's not a residential substance use uh, facility. Um, there, uh, we need those things too, uh, but the building could only be so high <laughs> and, uh, um, and it was funded for a very specific purpose. So yes, there will be all kinds of counselors and uh, providers with skills to help patients with their substance use disorders, but the patients will have uh, we usually have more than just that going on. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. I, I just have a subsequent question. So do you know, are there any plans for uh, more uh, drug rehab facilities in the Seattle area? That I do not know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Another thing to lobby for. Thank you. Yes, uh, but, that you should definitely do. Yeah. And then Ryan, doesn't the Behavioral Health Institute at Harborview going to have that focus? It, there's a portion of it. Yeah. yeah. Although, uh, uh, that's, uh, so I'm the chief of psychiatry at the UW Medical Center. Uh, the, that facility should be located at Harborview, which is also UW faculty, but I just know less about it. It was funded at, I, and I'm just speaking from my knowledge of what was funded from the state legislative budget is, but as part of that um, behavioral health package, uh, a behavioral health institute at Harborview was also funded. And reading newspapers, my understanding is that the focus of that was more towards um, uh, substance abuse. Yeah, or I think a part of that was the bond that we passed in this county as well to help support um, that, that mission. And again, I'm not an expert on this. I'm going off of my knowledge reading the Seattle Times. So <laughs> just to clarify. Uh, Karen. Thank you very much for the presentation. I haven't seen the exterior of the building before and it looks beautiful. Uh, it's, yeah. it's really nice looking. I was wondering if you could comment on um, parking um, on on campus thinking about the increase in staff as well as if you're aware of any um, things that may change regarding transit and metro coming to or from the campus um, bus routes or anything like that that we would want to know about from a, a neighborhood perspective. Yeah, I, I can start off with answering that. Um, with the with the project, we're increasing the parking on campus by about 30 stalls, That's approximately, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, and those are surface that are just on the ground, not in the garage or anything, surface lots, so, um, and near the facility. Um, so that's one thing that is occurring. Um, 
And then we, there has been some changes to transit patterns when the Northgate Link Light Rail Station opened. Um, and so that there was more service uh, coming to and from the link station. Um, there wasn't a substantial change to transit service directly to Northwest, uh, but we still will have the routes that are currently going down Meridian and the one route that comes onto the Northwest campus. And Julie, Julie, as part of this study that we had done for this facility, it included if we had enough parking stalls on campus to accommodate the building, and the study did indicate that it did. That's right. That's right. So building a bike storage uh, within the parking garage to, um, for bike commuters and to have a safer place to park bicycles. Right now, most of the bike park storage is um, either outside or in, in kind of separated lockers. We believe this will create a safer environment for bike commuters. Um, I don't see any hands up. If you can't figure out how to put your hand up, somebody could just ask a question now. One other thing about um, uh, circulation and such, we're also, as part of the project, we are improving um, our side of 120th Street. We will be putting in a curb gutter, a planning strip with additional street trees and a sidewalk, the full length of uh, our property along 120th. Um, on Burke, there's a little um, turnaround, kind of a hammerhead turnaround at the end of that cul-de-sac. Uh, that We're making some improvements to that to make it a little bit easier with some new vegetation and, and street trees along that edge as well. So, um, and we're doing some sidewalk improvements around the project and from the project to the existing bus stop that's on the campus and then all the way to 115th. So we're really uh, trying to uh, increase the accessibility to the transit and connections to the link light rail station. Thank you, uh, Dave. I was wondering, um, is there anything that you guys can think of that uh, might be helpful for you and the facility and the ongoing operations of it that the community that surrounds it could, could provide or something that we could do to be supportive? Can you think of anything? I love the question. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, though. Um, but we will definitely ponder that, and I and I appreciate I appreciate the question. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. I think just sharing information. It feels like this has been a very positive uh, conversation, and um, I think sometimes there are are we fear the unknown and change in a neighborhood. And I think if if you could share what you learned about the project. Um, and some of the positive comments that we're reading in the chat that will might help ease folks and that they could direct their questions. Pam is our, uh, the community liaison. We'd rather be um, learning more from the community and interacting than have people carrying fears outside uh, that we're not aware of uh, that could have a negative um, impact on the program unintentionally. Ethan, I have a Thank question. You, uh, Jim. Uh, oh, go ahead, Randy. Yes, hi. Um, how, many, how many current entrances, auto entrances are there to the campus? Vehicle entrances? There's yes. currently the main entrance on 115th. We have a secondary um, access point on 120th and that is usually closed. There's only a few special deliveries or certain times that that is used for. Um, it is not used for by staff or visitors or patients, but periodically for some of the facilities service. 
And to your knowledge, there, there, there is, there will be no other access points. Correct. We're not, if you're asking, are we adding any additional access points for this building? Exactly. The, is, uh, yeah, uh, no, the, the campus, the campus in general. No, not at this time. We have no, no plans to do that at this time. We, it's just the, the one, what you see on 115th, there's this separate one for staff and then the main one that are both on 115th. And then the one Julie's talking about is really specific for emergency purposes, or I, I think we did get special permission for this construction project, but not as a main entrance or exit now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim, could you go ahead? Uh, right, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions in chat, so I expect we're not gonna get to those. So I'll, I'll just, <laughs> I'll look say what I hope to get through. Um, the, uh, in the, as the architects put this facility together, I'm wondering if whether or not you considered the, uh, the various aspects of uh, more um, person-centered sort of type facilities. I, I'm, I'm using if you're familiar with the uh, Halverson Cancer Care Center in, the, in Evergreen in uh, Kirkland, when I saw your pictures and drawings and so on, I said, jeepers, that looks like that facility. I mean, it was really close. Uh, picture, you know, up, uh, out every window, great big windows, out the windows are, there's a lot of uh, uh, flowers, vegetation, and what have you, nice views out the windows, the colors inside are pastel, uh, waiting rooms are friendly, more like, you know, more like a home, uh, and I used, uh, familiar, if, if any of you are familiar with the uh, peer respite or a Soteria home, a Soteria house centers who, who have more of a welcoming setup as far as greeting people when they come in, you know, have a peer counselor maybe at the door, those type of things. And uh, my, my observation is that Halverson is, is, uh, is all over this kind of stuff. I don't know how new that facility is. Looks like within the last 10 years anyway. But, but you might, given that this facility isn't up and operating yet, I hope that, that when you do get close to opening, you're going to have a virtual walkthrough kind of uh, video or whatever, because boy, you really get a better feel for the facility and, and what it looks like when, uh, when you get to that point. But if not, I, I, anybody who is on this call, I suggest you take a look at uh, Halverson, Halverson's Cancer Care Center in, uh, in, uh, in Kirkland at the Evergreen Hospital and see it, if it doesn't just strike you that it looks so much like this facility. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, the, the idea of a virtual walkthrough or a video walkthrough is a great one. We, uh, lots of uh, friends and family members have never been on a psychiatry floor before and they have lots of misconceptions uh, or they're accurate conceptions, they're just dated um, from older facilities. And so, Part of this is too is removing that stigma such that uh, people want to come visit uh, and support their loved ones. And so the idea of a video is a great one. That way people know what to expect and aren't thinking something out of a out of a movie. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Doug, was your question was your question answered? Doug, uh, well, question. it wasn't. So I'll make it really quick. Uh, do you anticipate any uh, business development or activities out off campus as a result of this, like uh, more like a hotel or a restaurant or facilities that would su be supporting the campus that would impact our community in terms of other activities off campus, but related to the construction? I'm not aware of any. Jeannie, you can, there's nothing that's ever come up related to it. It's really just been this building. Thanks. There was a question in the chat that um, Ryan, you might be able to answer. What does the intake referral process look like for patients? Will it prioritize residents of Northwest Seattle? Um, so the, Part of the facility serves the catchment area of the emergency room. 
which is Northeast Seattle. Um, so for example, a lot of the patients on the current, um, a lot of the geriatric patients and the other adult patients who are already there on the psychiatry unit uh, came in via our emergency room. Um, the, and then the longer term patients, the, the idea is that they will be regional. Whether they're prioritized specifically to Northeast Seattle, I don't know if, any, if that's been, I don't have a sense of how many patients in that kind, uh, in that pi patient population, would come from this area. I just, I don't know exactly, but the the idea is though that it's a it's a regional facility. So you might have to tolerate Northwest Seattle <laughs> and Southwest and Southeast and uh, Shoreline and things like that. It, there's probably a broader catchment area for some of the beds um, than there are for all of the rest of them. I had a question, sort of the inverse of the one about businesses being set up outside, uh, there aren't very many restaurants near the hospital. Is the cafeteria open to the public? I will public answer feet? that and, and say that if you had asked me before the pandemic, the answer would have been absolutely yes. Right now, we, are, we do have restrictive access because of COVID. Um, our hope is that that won't continue for forever and that we can open it up again. But I, I can't answer that right now just due to the pandemic. Thank you. Celia? Yeah, I just realized, and maybe I missed something, but is this a teaching facility? I, I see it being called that. What does that mean? Yeah, I can answer that. So that's, that is part of the point. That's part of the reason why the UW uh, is partnering with the state. So the I mentioned that we have the largest psychiatry residency program in the country. That's the four years that psychiatrists spend after medical school, getting a specific training in psychiatry, the, the offices of that program will be in this building. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there will also be, we've, I mentioned we started a nurse practitioner, psychiatry nurse practitioner fellowship. Uh, in uh, There will be nursing students, UW nursing students rotate through our buildings, UW social work students, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, all these things have training programs within the uh, um, the University of Washington. And the idea is that uh, this will be a great trace to train and uh, we should train, if people are gonna work alongside each other, they should train alongside each other too, all these different specialties. And so, and also I'd like, I'd like uh, people to get comfortable with patients with behavioral health issues, and not um, be impacted by the, the stigma. So, uh, so yes, and so, and then I mentioned briefly um, the idea that when you design a building for this, it also means you design certain spaces slightly differently. So when I'm talking to a patient in this uh, building, I often will have a psychiatry resident with me, a medical student with me, a social worker with me. And so you need, you need a space to talk to the patients that's big enough for five or six people rather than two people and things like this. Um, there are also offices, you know, the, we teach people in teams. And so there are team rooms where uh, the trainees all sit together and, and do their work and get uh, um, lectures and things like that. And so uh, that's a big piece of why we thought this would be uh, useful. Um, and then the idea is that folks have a good enough experience when they're training that they wanna stick around Washington. And, um, and a lot of the mission of at least the School of Medicine is to train uh, physicians in this five state region uh, where there's a significant need for behavioral health providers. So um, that's, that's, a, that's the T in behavioral health teach. Sometimes we say, you see it as BHTF, behavioral health teaching facility, but that teaching thing is a big, a big mission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen. Hi, I was wondering if- hey, Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if there, if UW is doing anything, or maybe it's another agency to help increase um, mental health uh, treatment in outpatient as well. Because when patients leave and they're still needing to continue their journey to 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 fully heal, what will that look like as we discharge all these patients into the community? Will that be increasing in any way? Yeah, and we're even developing those things. Now, so uh, the advent of telehealth has really made a big difference for this. Um, so uh, 
for example, now we have at this at, on that campus, and it was something called an intensive outpatient program. This idea that there are patients who uh, they aren't so sick that they need to be hospitalized, or they be they're happier at home, but they need to be seen more than just once every four weeks by their provider for a while. And so there, uh, it's a several times a week uh, program where patients get to see physicians and therapists and things like that. And so, uh, and you can do well that used to be in person until COVID. And now we've uh, developed ways to do it um, via telehealth. And so that's also part of this idea that, um, I don't know, I don't, all these details aren't completely worked out, but the, the idea that you have some, that when you leave the hospital, you might need a higher level of care in that first bit that you will six months later and things like that. And so how do we find a way to transition patients um, out of the hospital without there being uh, so much of a drop off in resources. Um, we're working on that. That's part of also the reason why there is this telehealth space in, built in the facility. I mentioned the 24 hour um, line we have for prescribers in our state. Another part of it will be our kind of what are the opportunities uh, there to have psychiatrists who take care of patients while they're in the hospital, help them uh, in their transition out of it. Another thing that's kind of cool, and I learned this on the project, was that um, this care model really centers around um, educating families and, and care providers. So the, the welcoming nature of the building is, is such that people feel like they can be a part of the care model. And so you're not just leaving people without resource. And it really, um, I, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, Ryan, but I feel like that was a really interesting component that I had never heard about um, as part of the care model is really training the, the family and, and visitors, uh, I'm sorry, not just visitors, but the family and the, and the care providers uh, for these people um, so that care can continue at home and that you're not just leaving them without resource. Yep, we've even reserved an office through all the changes in the design. <laughs> uh, we've reserved an office and preserved an office in the building for NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, that has lots of its uh, programs uh, to help support family. And so um, that's a, that'll be a big piece of it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jim, you have another question? Try, try to get quickly to a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I had passed it earlier to Ryan. He just uh, didn't answer my question. <laughs> Uh, it relates to this very topic. Uh, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you're familiar with the University of Washington's REACH program? Yeah, yeah okay. And the, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, Spirit Lab, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Uh, uh, I guess having been a graduate of that program and a, and a believer in, uh, in, the, in the importance of caregivers and family members and so on, to get the education necessary for them to be able to handle transitions from healthcare facilities back into the home, or, or, or at least uh, in a position where the individual uh, family member can, can live the life as best they can. Uh, so is, is the plan, to any, any part of that curriculum or teaching uh, uh, part of that going to be done at this facility, or is that still going to be taking place uh, wherever it may be taking at this particular point in time. Well, those, those faculty are our faculty. So the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences right. includes psychiatrists and psychologists all across the UW and Harborview and Children's and the VA. And so uh, um, those are all in the, in the same family. And so, uh, um, and uh, psychology trainings will rotate at this facility too. And so, uh, um, I don't know, I can't say to, I'm not an expert in either of those two programs, um, but that's all in the, the nice part about having a huge uh, faculty with diverse interests is that we can then um, employ them and uh, they can do research and they can apply their research and turn it into actual clinical programs um, inside hospitals like this. So that'll be true for the addictions researchers we have and PTSD researchers we have and depression and schizophrenia and um, as well as the work um, 
around uh, programs for family support. Awesome. And Dr. Sarah Kopovich. Uh, yeah, Kapelovich. Kapelovich, mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. Yep. Uh, would be your person, I'm sure, for, for yep. any of that stuff. Thank I know you. her well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, and any other questions? I will say that I very much appreciate that we see in the chat too, lots of other people appreciating for one thing, the facility, for another thing, you guys coming out and educating us about this. I'm quite excited to have this here. Uh, do you have any closing remarks, any of you? Sorry, I'm on mute. I'll just say we really appreciate the fact that you've asked us to to join tonight and take up your take up your evening to give you this update. Um, it really means a lot. We really feel that we it's important that we partner with our community. Um, and we we really appreciate your partnership. And um, I'll turn it over to others if anyone wants to add anything. Okay. No, we, we again just want to thank you for for inviting us and giving us this opportunity. To Jeannie's point, I think I think it's it's important to communicate and educate regarding what the projects are happening on north on the Northwest campus. And we are always happy to come back and talk more. Thank you very much. So I'll Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'll close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you.